Being in transformation, change roles, you know, it is a roller coaster ride, but you, you, know, you are working towards an end goal and a deliverable by an end date. Remember how you got there, who you worked with, and making sure that you thank people along that journey. Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to the latest edition of Radical Transformation, the show where I have in depth conversations with the people who are transforming business today. And on this show, I draw out their real world experience, real world stories, and I bring them to you uh, on this show. So sit back. Put on the kettle uh, and enjoy. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Anu uh, Kalia, EMEA Strategy and Transformation Director at Reliance Worldwide Corporation. Welcome to the show, Anu. Anu's career in transformation formally started back in 2002 at Ford, um, where he trained and qualified as a Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt. Since then, it's gone from strength to strength, and he's had successful stints at GE Money, Vodafone, uh, Guy Carpenter, BT and Barclays, before recently joining um, as m and uh, lead, as also transformation director across EMEA, Reliance Worldwide Corporation, um, a business that's probably better known for brands like John Guest, Speedfit and Reliance Valves. And if you don't know, these brands, and, and I've, uh, I'm sure you'll tell me more, Anu, these deliver vital equipment to the building and construction industry. What else do they do? You know what, if um, in these warm summer days you also get um, drinks dispensed so the nice ice cold beer mm -hmm. in the barrel yep. is um, an extension of the valve technology that we use in pubs. Fantastic, fantastic. And I also understand that they're key for a lot of households, aren't they, in terms of... Yeah, absolutely. It ensures that your, um, I suppose, the water pressure into your home, the temperature yeah. um, is at the right levels. Fantastic. So all the um, plumbing behind the wall that you don't see. Fantastic. Yeah, vital. <laughs> So again, hello Anu, welcome to the show. Um, how's it going? Very well, um, thank you. So um, very busy, which is what I enjoy. So we'll mm -hmm. get to some of that um, in conversation in a bit, but um, very diverse organization, um, both from a, I suppose, a makeup, um, maturity, from being a family run business previously, but also the, um, the type of work. Yeah. So good. And for, for the listener, you may not know this, but um, Anu and I go back, I think it was, about 20 years ago that we were responsible for helping you find one of your roles at GE, is that right? That's correct. After my first, I suppose, um, uh, you know, experience um, at Ford Motor Company after six years, you placed me um, with uh, GE. So thank you, Mike. And the rest is history. The rest is history, as exactly. They say, <laughs> as they say. Um, so um, without any further ado, let's get down to mm. business, Anu. Um, I'm often struck by um, the fact that they don't really teach you how to do transformation at school or college, do they? So, um, you know, what I'm curious to know and what I'd like you to share with the reader, if you don't mind, mm. um, is how do you get into this line of work in the first place? And what advice would you give to um, the listener who's been asked right now perhaps to step up and transform their organisation? What would you tell them? And, you know, that's, that's, I would say it's a great question. I'm sure you've got loads more of those. But um, for me, um, from a personal perspective, I think transformation is defined in the, the I suppose, the eyes and, um, and the hands and the hearts of the receiver. So whether it be radical transformation, I believe it's any change. It's probably key. Um, in terms of your second part of your question, how did I enter that? In my experience um, was from selling insurance. So I'd gone straight through the academic um, route. Um, no, no work, luckily enough, but straight from graduation, went back home to Birmingham um, and looked to sell insurance for 18 months mm -hmm. um, as a consultant. So that was no leads, no farming, existing accounts, get the yellow pages out every Monday to book appointments for two weeks' time. Um, so you're building credibility and trust immediately as you're speaking to the uh, you know, cold calling, in essence, potential customers, and then two weeks' time knocking on doors. And I think this is where the relevance then comes through the last 20, 25 years of my career. Knocking on that door, meeting someone for the first time, no different to entering a meeting room of major, you know, senior sponsors um, and creating a vision. So sitting down, relating, establishing credibility, creating a vision for the future, um, for their family, for their aspirations, for their children, and then discussing how to get there. You know, that will require a plan, investment, resourcing. And I think taking that experience of selling insurance, I do that today. I create a vision um, mm -hmm. with my stakeholders and sponsors and look to gain their investment rather than a monthly premium, but through um, investment of resources, 
commitment, role modelling the change that we want to see through organisations. Um, like I said, not taught. Um, I'm sure my um, you know my manager selling me um, you know training me at that time was very much about creating the needs and the benefits and selling that insurance product from pensions to savings plans. But the I suppose the relevance of that, building the credibility, being able to relate, was something I've carried through that from that experience. Casting your mind back to those halcyon days when you were door knocking, I'd imagine you'd have had to uh, make a connection very, very quickly, wouldn't you? Yes, yes, oh, absolutely. And you know what? Eye contact, a big, broad, natural smile um, hasn't um, lost me for now. <laughs> so some, things, some things don't change. Um, but it's interesting you make those parallels because you weren't formally in a, in a change or transformative role at the time, mm. were you? But there were some takeaways there that, that you stand by today and that have served you well by the sounds and, of it. And definitely hold true. And, you know, and, and as we go through some of the examples and, um, you know, life experiences, you'll find the the people element is that consistency. Building the trust, building credibility, creating something where individuals can relate to. So it's putting yourself in their shoes. In yep. essence, speaking the language of the people receiving the change is definitely consistent throughout my career. Good. Cool. Let's explore transformation in a bit more detail because I know it can mean different things to different people. What does transformation mean to you and when does it become radical? You know what? It, it links to the previous question. For me, it's in the eyes of the receiver. So radical, radical for me. So a great example today. So, you know, we've, um, as RWC, um, we've acquired John Guest, a family run business, Four years ago, um, seven hundred million pound investment. Um, you know, it, it, and part of my role when I, when I joined circa th- four years ago now was to assist and help the business transform from a family-run business, highly successful, innovative entrepreneur business, to a corporate, but the right level of corporate where the rules, regulations, processes do not inhibit that innovation and entrepreneurship. Part of that transformation, and we talk about what's radical, is you know we we took out the old family-run mahogany offices that were run by the family. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, but very much um, you know, three brothers running the organisation. You you needed everything signed off by that that um, senior leadership team. We took out the offices, upgraded the offices to open plan, um, so you're accessible and open to staff and colleagues, so you didn't have that hierarchical structure. However, um, what we did for, um, find is, yes, we upgraded our facilities for senior management, however, the restrooms for our production staff, which sat be- beneath our manufacturing facility, hadn't been upgraded. So we've done that recently, and for me, that was radical for the receiver. They had seen the business transform, they had seen the business being acquired, but actually basic hygiene factors, and we can use the hygiene word in, in multiple um, senses for this example, but basic hygiene factors of upgrading the uh, you know, restroom facilities to the levels that the directors had and even the new owners had was radical. So that was about signalling to them that this place is going to change for the better, that we're committed to continue to invest and improve mm. um, in your business now that we're together. Exactly that. And actually, and, you come, and you're and you equally as important as the senior management team. You're, you know, we're all important parts of that machinery or the cogs that make the business work. Because we're in this together. Exactly. So there was a powerful message, you know, um, in there, I think, isn't there, for the yes. business? of course. Good, good. Let's come back to John Guest later because I know that sure. you know, there's some more threads that we we can pull there, aren't there, Anu? Yes. Around around that integration, which I sure. guess is an ongoing uh, project for you and for the business, isn't yes. it? Okay. Um, in in my experience, transformation programs can often be born out of a crisis, and as they say, um, never waste a good crisis. Yep. Um, so, has this been your experience first up at points in your career, and? and can you give our listeners some examples of how you've helped organisations successfully navigate through extremely challenging times, perhaps come out stronger the other side and not waste that crisis? Uh, you know what? Absolutely. So um, yeah. if you can cast your mind back, Mike, I think 2008, um, the financial crash. Um, so I was, at that time were, probably had done five years of my six, seven years at GE. G Money. Mm-hmm. So G Money at that time provided um, subprime mortgages. 
um, and a number of that customer base was sourced through, um, I suppose, clients that were unable to keep up monthly payments on their on their white label cards. So going shopping at Christmas for a, a nice TV, deferred interest um, payments. Come February, March, but payments were due, not affordable. So um, as part of the GE Money mortgage business, we would contact those customers and look to consolidate their loans. Um, you know, building a big, healthy, um, I suppose, loan book and, and client bank. When the subprime market crashed um, in 2008, where I suppose you know, people were unable to keep up with payments. Your repossessions went up, and this was a global financial crisis. Um, large organizations would securitize those loans and sell them on to banks. Um, 2008, I was the operational excellence lead at G Money when that market crashed. Um, we were forecasted to lose circa 500 million in the year. And you can imagine that, um, the, the, you know, it's easy to say, but that's, um, you know, through the losses through not receiving payments, having to wait circa a year to repossess those properties. And those properties would not necessarily have been in the condition that you would hope to then sell and reclaim some of the losses that you were making. So a lot of the projects that uh, myself and my team undertook were, you know, as broad as, you know, offshoring and outsourcing, focusing on the core, developing strategies that helped customers keep up payments. So, you know, hardship tools, um, preventing the, you know, litigation processes or repossession. How could you help customers pay? Although that payment period could be extended closing, in essence, our mortgage um, origination business and retraining our staff to become collectors. So having still having those right skills and experiences of customer contact, but almost refocusing rather than selling a product and a mortgage, now about how do you um, assist the customer in um, keeping up payments rather than that repossession or litigation route. So it's almost a sort of a complete pivot of people's job roles overnight. Absolutely. Absolutely that. And, you know, almost looking at what is core and what can we assist with onshore that anything administrative, transactional, therefore could be offshored, you know, whether that's mm-hmm. to be to India or, or Hungary or, or, or Egypt. So keeping that core as well as decommissioning brands. So, you know, you'd have a retail facing arm um, for GE money um, to you know, it would be advertised on TV to attract new customers. Actually, it was almost a lockdown of no more new originations. Let's ensure that our focus is on the core business, which is to, you know, I suppose, collect the money that was due, but with a focus that's helping the end customer. Interesting, interesting. So you were on point for that, were you? Absolutely. Um, very long hours. Um, you know, GE, very reputable brand. Um you know, wide global stakeholders to ensure that we had a plan to mitigate those risks. That included working with, you know, representatives from McKinsey that had seen other businesses struggle and learn from those as well, Um, as well as building a very high, um, you know, high quality, high diverse team from, you know, Lean Six Sigma black belts to contact center, workforce management, capacity planners, um, quality control to, um, you know, analysts that could review data and um, help us define, I suppose, you know, customers in segmentation and their likelihood to pay and therefore what treatment strategies they would need. And what skills did you require to help the business navigate through those very challenging times? Because I'd imagine you didn't have long to to, to achieve this, to, to turn the business around. Mm-hmm. Um, you didn't have the benefit of months and months of planning here, did you? You had to move very, very quickly. Yes, um, I, you know what, I think building that high-performing team helps. Mm-hmm. Different skill sets, um, a diverse view on how to tackle problems. But in addition to that, I think from a personal perspective, keep calm. Okay. There's a lot of noise. And carry on. And carry on. Oh, exactly that. There's a lot of noise. And, um, you know, even if, um, even like now, before above this table, I'm calm. My heart's probably pound, uh, pounding and the, the legs are going like a swan. But actually, as a leader of an organisation, you provide that calmness. So and through your team. being aware of your shadow. Absolutely that. Absolutely that. No, I follow that. But yeah, but one, you know, remember the, the shadow that you cast as a leader. Okay. And role model those behaviours as, as a result. So that calmness, uh, you know, and there have been occasions throughout my career, you know, the 10 to 15 years post-G and post this example, you know, crises happen. 
there is chaos. There are, you know, events that you don't anticipate and you can't control. That level of calmness really assists both your peer group, your leaders, leadership teams, but also your the colleagues that are going through this change. What else did you learn from that experience, and what are the other takeaways? I think structure is good. Um, you know, once you identify what the problem is to solve, not every problem will be solved in the same way. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, I suppose the, the good old Demaic approach has never failed or the five whys has never failed in terms of if a problem is, you know, what do we need to out, you know, what do we need to outsource or what is core? You still follow that clear. What is the problem that we're looking to solve? How bad is it? Mm-hmm. What's the root causes to it? And then how do we look to step wise and um, using, you know, basic project management or project management look to um, execute on that? Got it, got it. And for those of our listeners who aren't aware of what DMAIC is, uh, and who define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. Fantastic. Fundamentals of uh, uh, Six Sigma, um, very much championed by G and Jack Welsh. Yeah. And it's not even, and you're right, uh, Mike, it's, it's uh, you know, used the methodology today, but it's not a methodology. I think it's a way of thinking. Mm-hmm. 100%. Mm. Um, has it been the norm in the organizations you've worked in to have a corporate methodology if you like an approach to problem solving to to um, undergo transformation is it essential as well i've seen it less now um i think you're right i think my early days at ford and ge there was in large corporates i could see the need for a consistent methodology terms terms an approach so you know globally you could learn share best practice mm-hmm. so i could understand that consistency of having that appropriate toolkit what i found um you know, as as the careers progress, it's less about the labels. Yes. You know, it's less about the lean, less about the Six Sigma, Agile, or it's more about the right tools and experience for the problem that you're trying to solve. Mm-hmm. So I guess I know the answers to this question. I'm going to ask it anyway. When, when you're building your high performance teams, mm. are you led by people who bring a methodology, a common set of um, tools to approach problems or do you um, look for and prize other qualities over and above um, someone's schooling someone's corporate methodology sure. and education I think there's a I suppose there's a there's a base I um, mean you know when, when going to recruiters or headhunters there's a level of you know a basic criteria of so you know and it's not necessarily mandatory, desirable, I would say, you know, graduate desirable, Lean Six Sigma, less about the corporate piece and project management, less about which corporate they've acquired that from, but do they have a toolkit of problem solving ability um, and that track record of that? Personally, what I look for then is more the personality, you know, adaptability to culture, the drive for results, um, not necessarily, you know, aligned to a specific toolkit or an approach. It's that having that flexibility, definitely the drive for results, eagerness, talent, um, ambition to succeed and make it happen. Got it. How do you assess that? Because often the interview process, as you know, is, uh, is an imperfect, mm. can be an imperfect uh, process um, and, and you don't have long to make that assessment. How do you, um, going above and beyond trusting your gut, get a read on somebody's interpersonal skills, I guess what we might call EQ here, yes. and their ability to be effective in the organisation and in the role that you're hiring them for. Mm-hmm. How do you make that assessment? And, and, and you know, great experience with um, people like yourself, Mike. I think um, you, know, you build a network that you trust who know you as an individual, who know the people that you've worked with in the past and, you know, are they 20, 25 plus years of working? I've met a lot of um, individuals that, um, that have progressed through organizations that have worked with me as well, and then been consistent with the people that I use um, in terms of finding that talent for me. That's number one. So mm-hmm. that criteria of a very base um, technical skills, but then the, the sifting and sorting before they come to me. But then my interview process then is actually not focused on technical skills at all. It is open-ended questions and scenarios on where individuals have shown that EQ, where how they have managed difficult, challenging situations. So the interview then is very much based on the softer skills because the technical skills have been seen on the CV, the pre-filtering, you know, filtering, the contacts that I've got, like I say, similar to yourself, that have gone through that appraisal process. So I'd say even, um, I remember some time at BT, the, the lift would be a good five-minute walk from reception to the, um, to the floor, that we, you know, the ground floor. 
And then the eight floors up, that will give you another 10 minutes to speak to the individuals as you're warming them up before the interview. And another 10 minutes as you're walking down where you see the, the true personalities come through. Yeah, understood. So that, that, that ele- was deliberate. That so elevator. I've given my secret away now. <laughs> so for future candidates, it is that the walk up and walk down, there is the reason why you're not collected. And that's why me. So if you ever meet Anu and you're coming for an interview and you're in the lift, you know what's happening. Exactly that. Exactly. Uh, I got it. Cool. Let's move on, Anu. Um, I said that we'd revisit this topic. So Mm. I want to go back to um, the acquisition, a big acquisition, 700 million pound acquisition of John Guest, I believe, back in, was it 2017, 2018, 2018, just before you joined the organization. Um, And that was a family owned brand, as you say, family owned business. uh, And you've been responsible for helping to integrate John Guest into RWC and, and, and essentially bring this family owned business um, into a global corporate whilst looking to retain the best parts of mm-hmm. John Guest, namely the entrepreneurship, the innovation, um, the things that made it great whilst welding its culture into yours to make the whole stronger than the sum of its parts. Sure. Um, and at the same time, I understand that you've got some other challenges. You're a very local business, for those that you don't know, to West London. Um, you've got a hugely loyal workforce, many of whom have been with the business for 20 plus years. Um, and at 20% of your workforce, I understand, are approaching retirement in the next five years, so 55 years mm-hmm. plus. So um, forgive the long sort of uh, uh, context, but against this backdrop, um, what challenges is this presenting to you now, that, that integration still to this day? And what transformational strategies have you adopted to future-proof both the business as it is today, as well as this significant investment you've made? And I'm obviously positioning this with other people like yourself in mind mm-hmm. who may be going through or about to go through an acquisition or to be acquired. Sure. So what advice and what guidance can, can you share with, with us? Sure. And I think... Um and you're right, Mike, there are, there are stages to that integra- you know, acquisition integration and then the pace defined by the organisation to full integration. And when I talk about pace, that also means the, the definition on what full integration is. Because to your point, we don't want to lose the reason for acquisition. You know, intervent- you know innovation, entrepreneurship, the fact that um, people stay for longer, recognising there is no legal retirement age. That is a, um, I suppose, you know, a risk that we need to consider. Um, you know, losing a fifth of your workforce over a period, a short period of time, you are losing a skill set, a knowledge base, experience that not necessarily has been mapped um, to the level that you want. Because the reality is, you know, you get the should be process on a shelf. The knowledge is really in the mind. So, how do you transfer that knowledge? In addition to, you need to ensure that the front end of your pipeline coming through. Um, also has that ability of making tools, for example, or molding, injection molding, which isn't a, a trade that you know is readily available. So um, you know, it, so we're, we're on the I suppose four years since acquisition. Um, we're aware of the age profile. We're also aware that we need to attract the right talent. And in the location that we're in, the develop one of the strategies that we've developed is and accepting is diversity is a given. You know different education it's not what you just what you see at the you know the surface in terms of the color of the skin or the gender or religion that you follow west london and where we're based in west drayton is very diverse it's a real melting pot isn't it exactly that very diverse both from you know ethnic ethnic backgrounds religion um financial situations and circumstances it's 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 melting pot it's a great it's a great way to define it and our our workforce replicates that local demographic mm-hmm. um which which is good so you know which means you know we have expertise in within our you know our, our colleagues and our workforce that will allow us to be educated on our, our own diversity and then how do you use that to address business problems like the aging workforce problem or enabling more inclusion so an example of that i suppose is our partnership with harlington school we have circa 800 employees in west drayton the majority of those are manufacturing production mm-hmm. uh, with professional services hr you know my team finance it and so and so on so we have opportunities um but we hadn't 
necessarily looked at our local demographics. So this is a very, I suppose, data-led um, strategy that looks at how do we ensure the challenged um, pupils of Harlington, and I'll define challenged in a bit, but how do the, the individuals from Harlington, and we give those um, kids and pupils opportunities for the future. Those opportunities could be apprenticeships, work experience, to undergraduate programs, to um, you know, coming back from university as graduate roles. Um, so how do you attract them and attract them early to actually accepting there are issues today that they need support with? And those um, you know issues could well be building their well they are building their resilience, communication, and teamwork skills, which have really suffered not just in Harlington or West London, but through COVID. So you know kids being stuck at home and and therefore not conversing, not going out. They you know a lot of their confidence has therefore been um, yeah sunk. learning through screens, missing out on the playground experience, missing out on a lot of the. Um, formative experiences that you and I would would have would have gone through as kids growing up. Absolutely, um, I think it's fantastic. Tell us more about how that's working sure. and what difference that's making to your organisation in reversing, if you like, the um, the brain drain that, that you're at risk mm. of suffering here. Sure, to your business and probably two examples. I think one is addressing the exactly you know the the loss of you know not communication but confidence and therefore translated to resilience, communication, and teamwork. The one example there is um, we work alongside the Outward Bound Trust, who are a charity, um, and we and this is our second year now. So we, over the two years, we've taken a hundred pupils. Um, from Harlington School to the Lake Districts. We spend a week with them. When I say we, um, we, that's four ambassadors from um, RWC, four teachers and 48 children, um, 16 to 18 year olds, um, and canoeing, mountain climbing, a lot of sporting activities, camping events. And the, you know, it sounds like fun, but it's hard work. But the outcome is very much about how do we build the confidence of those, of the kid, of the children, um, to uh, you know go back to school a bit different, a bit more confident, and it's interesting where we talked about um, you know playing in playgrounds or going out. A lot of the children have not been outside of London, so seeing the greenery, the mountains, the hills, is a complete game change. Mm. You know, it's a brand new environment, which you know um, with. 48 children of 16 to 18 brings a lot of um, challenges as well um, in terms of looking after them and making sure that they're um, well behaved. But it does give a level of, um, I suppose, a lot of empowerment for them to learn and, this, and the situation that we create for, to enable them to learn from that experience. The second example is the partnership we've started um, with Harlington based on a com- side conversation um, with a teacher, you know, Natalie Patel, um, she looks after the behavioural unit. So where, you know, children are need a lot more support than the normal process within schooling. Um, it was it was a, a conversation regarding breakfast. Um, circa a hundred to one hundred and twenty pupils every day come to Harlington having had no breakfast. Now that. that Sounds like, okay, they've had no breakfast. There's a number of children that don't have breakfast, but um, they don't have breakfast because their parents can't afford it. But they also don't have dinner because, you know, the, the financial situations or the recreational um, pursuits of the parents and what they choose to do also means the children come to school with no dinner and no breakfast. So as things stand, the best shot they got at getting fed at this rate is, is lunch at school. Correct, through the lunch vouchers scheme. Got it. But the teachers were actually funding um, a breakfast club themselves. Out of their own pockets. Out of their own pockets um, every wow. morning. Um, and almost, you know, not begging for bowls and spoons and from the lunchtime catering um, for, for the pupils. Well, that was an easy one for us. So that was an easy one from, from an RWC perspective in terms of focusing the charity work that our employee resource groups do and creating a breakfast for Harlington Fund. Amazing. And, and, that, and that's now feeding 120 kids a, who have it tough. A day. A day locally. Exactly that. So, you know, it's, and it's a great example. We have a great example of, you know, we produce plastic valves and plastic pipe. Right. Environmentally, there's a lot of focus on us. 
and, and with packaging and so on. And the great link between sustainability and social impact, you know, it's been a really simple quick win where we've started to segregate our waste, our metal waste in the production process. So there will be metal that you can recycle and reuse into the process, or there'll be non-ferrous metal that you can't. So we've now segregated our metal, um, get it weighed, and there are um, buyers for that metal. So the non-ferrous metal and the non-segregation where we wouldn't do that before, you know, we'd put it all together and almost away from us. You know, we don't own it anymore. However, we segregate it. We recycle what we can. The stuff that we can't recycle, we sell. The proceeds of that non-ferrous sale, which um, I think on Friday generated £3,000, has gone straight into the Harlington Breakfast Club. Fantastic. It's a fantastic story. It is. No, and, and real. And I say we, we, we get these stories now every single day. You know, a mother um, wrote us an email from Harlington School on her son returning from Outward Bound. And, you know, first time he's climbed, the first time he's tried curry, <laughs> you know, the first time he's had to, you know, speak in front of so many of his yeah. peer group. A lot of, um, yeah, the sound bites will make, it, will, will make it real and humbling. I can see that and I can see... Um it must make you and, and mm. um, everyone at, at RWC tremendously proud to be putting something back into the community. Essentially, what is an outreach program? Yeah. Um, I have to ask, has it been good for business as well? Are you starting to see um, these kids uh, take an interest in potentially working for your business, spending more time, not just summer placements, but potentially coming back from university if they make it to university or mm. coming straight in an apprentice scheme um, to be able to continue um, the business as that next generation? Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, so will we? Yes. Have we? Too early. It's probably, you know, it's the, it's the honest it's answer. It's a work in progress. It's a long term, you know, and, you know, I think it's a long-term strategy rather than an initiative is probably the best best way to put it because we need to show role models. We need to demonstrate role models, you know. Um, so it's interesting, our head of procurement that looks after 80 million, you know, uh, purchasing budget, she's an ex-student from Harlington. But they need to see that. <laughs> they can see what, what is the um, the art of the possible and, and provide those opportunities to do so. Whereas I believe the area has been challenged. You know, it's under you know underprivileged. They they need role models. They need to see how it works. So through work experience, so we've opened a work experience. There are students that are that join us for work experience site tours um, with apprentices. I believe we will become more proactive in assisting with CV writing applications and getting those children on board and helping with the school. I think it's a fantastic case study, and I think we should revisit this at some point. And when, Definitely. when, as you say, it's 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 progressed, and and you mm. start to create those role models. And I, listening to you, I think a lot of what you're about is about modelling behaviours and creating those role models within organisations. Mm-hmm. And I think that's been the case not just at RWC, but wherever you've been, isn't it? Yeah, I think you know a great. So we, you know, we've talked about the GE and the, and the cost-driven crisis with the subprime. We've talked we've talked about the RWC and and the acquisition um, and how do you make that into a corporate? I think the BT role, um, the role at the BT, which was the lead of continuous improvement, the I suppose the burning platform or the catalyst or the crisis there was very interesting. You know, BT highly successful organisation, part of then the FTSE twenty. Um, circa 170,000 global employees and you know everyone knows the brand as well right um, they they needed a program um, where the organization had been very successful in cost transformations um, their I suppose their positioning was very much organizational health and performance can go together okay so you can have pride in the organization um, empowered and engaged employees that would deliver performance. It, it sounds obvious, right? It sounds obvious, but change, let's change the dynamic to not being top-down, but actually develop a program um, that empowers everyone at BT to solve problems in the same way, and they feel empowered to do so. So um, led a team, um, and actually built from scratch, um, a team of circa 40 coaches rather than consultants so internal coaches who were experts in um, Lean Six Sigma you know agile project management but the skill was to uh, pick out the right the relevant tools and coach 
you know, contact center agents to engineers in vans at BT to, you know, your IT marketing teams on holding daily huddles, um, identifying issues and problems, both as teams, as individuals and for customers that they could look to resolve. So we spent, I think we we spent five, four, four to five years, one of the, I think, the largest deployments across a large FTSE organization, changing the culture, I think, um, in terms of what was done, so we and how our problems were solved. So we we you know deployed circa fifty thousand people, and as far as you know, from going all the way from Alness um, in Scotland to you know South America to Malaysia to India, contact centres. So a global reach, a global program. At the end of four years, delivered four hundred million to the bottom line. Um, the BT, but the key piece being it, it drove employee engagement scores up, customer service um, improvement, circa 20% improvement on KPIs across customer service. So a real good people-led transformation activity. So a couple of things I'm going to pick up on there. Mm. Um, one, the term coach rather than consultant, I think is really interesting and maybe you could elaborate on that. Sure. But two, and I remember working with BT at this point, didn't you spend a lot of time on Lego? We did. You're right, um, and it's interesting now because that, like I say, that that is almost eight to nine years ago now. It seems like a long time, but you know, it was learning through gamification. Um, whether you were a contact center agent, um, an engineer in a van, um, or marketing, our sessions to introduce continuous improvement were through Lego. And you're right, Mike. You attended one of those sessions. I remember. <laughs> it was great. Um, why did you choose Lego? Why was that your vehicle? Um, you know what? Um, Lego, stickle bricks, um, people use catapults. Yeah. Um, it's it's learning through gamification. It's understanding how and why people, delivery, quality and cost are important. And you, if you can um, do that, learn through fun, and but then have re- relevant sessions within that gamification that relates back to the role that you will do following the Lego sessions, it stays in people's minds. I always thought it was brilliant because, um, you know, no pun intended, but the building blocks of change here, but also something that everyone can relate to because most people, kids, would have played with Lego. Yes. So as absolutely. a lowest common denominator, it's a fantastic tool, but um, mm. I thought it was an incredibly smart um, approach taken at the time to get everyone starting to um, think the same and be on the same page. I thought it was a really powerful way that, of doing that. that. Great. And then, you know what, Mike, we actually used the same game, you know, from the you know from the bottom of the organisation, and it's not being derogatory, but from the the, the land swell of the organisation, up the pyramid. So the same gamification was used for consistency. So, so to the, the exec level. So you had the Lego in the boardroom. Yeah, exactly that. How did that work? Very competitive. <laughs> Probably the worst performing in terms of time. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. <coughs> Fantastic. I'm going to embarrass you a little bit now. Um, I hear you're an award winning. Oh transformation director tell us about when that came about and and, and ah, okay I, I can thank the um the bqf which is the british quality foundation for that so the british quality foundation have been i suppose in existence for 30 years yep. um large corporates i believe got together um to recognize quality and business excellence so mm-hmm. for 30 years ago on an annual basis they have awards that recognize you know, transformation projects, transformation individuals, and that that's expanded over the years to include things like you know living your living your values, social impact. So the awards and the recognition and and the training has expanded. But it's an organisation; it's um, non profit making charity, but it provides training to organisations, certifications on Lean Six Sigma and so on. Um, so a couple of years ago, I was recognised as a, an established leader for transformation. Congratulations. Thank you. And I believe you're on the panel this summer, is that right? For it the, is, and for the same award. So um, I suppose there's a level of experience having held the award to see what the next generation and upcoming leaders have done and what they can do. And part of that, um, I suppose, the award allows you to network, extends your mentoring group as well um, in terms of mentoring others outside of your organisation. And to our listeners who are transformational professionals themselves who are perhaps... Um, considering submitting a, a project or program for review at those awards. Mm-hmm. Um, as a judge, 
what 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 do you look for? What if you don't mind me asking the question? But what 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 sure. catches your eye? What 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 really I think sets a, a great program apart from a good program? Uh, and that's you know that's a great question, and it probably relates to the first answer, right? What problem were you looking to solve? Is it's a good one? What it, or the um, and, you know problem, or situation, challenge, or opportunity you were looking to, uh, and how well you articulate that from an elevator speech perspective. Um, what what how did you what did you do to solve it? What was the impact? And the key one, your key learnings. Brilliant, and that humility around that as well. Yeah. No, absolutely. So. Absolutely. So there you go, listeners. That's where you heard it first of all from from one of this year's judges. That's uh, that's what you have to demonstrate to uh, to deliver an award winning program. And I want to wrap up now. Um, but in closing, what three tips would you like to share with our listeners? Um, if you like your transformation non negotiables, the things you have to get right. Mm-hmm. And we can go back to the friends provident piece. You know, um, I suppose. Building that credibility and being able to relate, I'd say the key enabler to that is humility. Be humble. Yeah, I think transformation, being in transformation, change roles. You know, it is a roller coaster ride, but you you are working towards an end goal and a deliverable by an end date. You know, remember how you got there, and how who you worked with. and making sure that you thank people along that journey. So there's a level of humility. Um, Recognise, you you know, everything's a key learning. Um, Every event is a key learning. And be able to soak that in. You know, no one's a finished article. That's probably what, that's a wrapping up one (laughs) as as humility. And I think that also um, is a good segue back into your comment about being that coach, not the consultant. Yes, no, absolutely that. You know, and I and it's one of those interview questions. I'm giving away my secrets here, but I I, I usually ask um, my candidate what their definition or their difference they believe of a coach, trainer, and a mentor, and ask them that question and to understand therefore the different hats that you need to wear as a leader, depending depending on the situation. And I think consult is, is is very similar as well. So at BT, that hand holding through, you know, we're about to give you a number of tools. It isn't a training lesson um, and it's not mentoring. There will be specific problems and we will help you and coach you through which tool to apply at the right time. And why, why the, you know, the coach role was so important to that. Got it. Got it. And anything else you'd like to add, share with the listener? Um, or any parting thoughts you'd like to leave us with? You know what? I would say put yourself in the shoes of the receiver. Got it. Got it. I know you've been great. Thanks so much for coming on um, Radical Transformation Podcast today. Absolutely loved having you on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike.